I want to talk about life on this side of the fence. So we come up with metaphors and frameworks and ways of ways of seeing and understanding what is a really confusing and challenging experience. And and I have metaphors like which side of the fence and um, uh, and the thing about permanent residents, citizens, permanent residents, temporary residents, tourists and those people who are being exiled. And this helps me to understand the culture I've come from, which is on this side of the fence, and the culture I found myself in on this side of the fence. And also the place that I'm going to end up, which is the bus that's going around the block and will come and pick me up eventually. So on this side of the fence, there are all kinds of people. Uh, there are people who um, who never ever think about uh, their longevity, their mortality. They don't have to. They 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 are just they they've never had to really face uh, something like a terminal illness. That um, they have a reasonably clear. Uh, statistically based, <laughs> uh, results based, tests based, scans based um, confrontation of, of the fact that their life is going to be significantly short. And uh, for me, in September, that's where I found myself. So I was a breast cancer patient uh, already and um, in September I found out that my cancer had got into my spine and um, had gone very extensively throughout my liver and you can live a long time with with it in your bones and uh, like in your spine you can live five years ten years some people live 15 years so there's a lot they can do to hold back the damage of uh, metastatic breast cancer to bone for example and uh, but with liver it's it's more challenging it's a very blood rich environment and the liver does a lot of really important irreplaceable jobs in the body and uh, as tumors grow, the liver enlarges and it can crush the functions of other organs. So it stops functioning, it stops cleaning, cleaning out your blood, it stops um, producing your enzymes, it stops, uh, it lets a lot of toxins sort of just flood your brain and uh, makes it really hard to function. But it also can squash your stomach and make it very difficult to eat or drink. It can squash one of your kidneys, it can squash your diaphragm and make it really hard to breathe. Or with only half your lung capacity so ultimately that can really um, put you in a very different way of living and that's where I was around September when they diagnosed it and I was really lucky because I probably had about two months to live when that was diagnosed and um, uh, because it was crushing everything because I had a uh, hundred times the high ferritin levels so I was being poisoned by the, the liver being unable to function and I was getting unable to break down fats. I could only eat a quarter of my food intake and I had to choose between the cat and Max between eating and drinking um, because I couldn't do both. Um, I could only breathe with half my lung capacity so by afternoon it was very hard to breathe and speak. And luckily because the chemo they put me on um, really uh, was greatly effective in reducing the degree of the tumors and therefore uh, reducing the size of the liver I got back the ability to breathe and speak and eat and drink and and it's been a good quality of life so far and I'm at that two months mark where I would have been dead and I'm definitely far from dead <laughs> um, but even so that drug that I'm on is they've tested that on thousands and thousands and thousands of people and so they know that the cancer cells uh, tend to mutate and not be affected by that drug anymore around the 10 month mark which will be around July when that happens um, at the moment there there are other drugs that they can try these will only help around 30 percent of people so I might be in the 70 percent I might be in the 30 percent but I have um, neutropenia which is a kind of um, immune deficiency issue and the drug I'm on is is meant to be the easiest drug with neutropenia and I'm not able to have full doses most of the time and I can't have the full regime because my 
that part of my immunity, my neutrophils is, is never high enough to do that. So I know that the next drug, even if I am in the 30%, um, I might not be able to use it because of the immunity problem. And, and so I have a, a pretty clear sense that in July, around July next year, I'll be facing the, the fact that the cancer is back out of control and um, uh, that the next drug may, may work for me, may not work for me, but in any case, my immunity may let me down. And that will mean it'll take about two months because it's quite aggressive. The cancer's quite aggressive. And it'll take about two months for that to all get back to how it was this September. And after that, I'll probably have about another two months to live. So about four months from July, I will be in the state where my cancer would have killed me. But because I have a failed respiratory drive, that means I can take my mask off and my brain won't keep me breathing, which is a different condition that I developed around 2012. And so I only breathe for myself without the machine for a minute or so every uh, 30 to 90 minutes. So I will be quite quickly dead when I choose to be. And I will probably choose to be around two months after my cancer drugs stop working. So that will be around uh, September um, next year where I'll probably make those choices. Um, so that's my life. That's how I see my life. And I, I cannot escape that because every week I go in and have blood work on Mondays so they can see whether I can have a chemo. On Tuesdays I get all my drugs that keep my cancer cells in, in a managed state for however long we can do that. And so far I had a 75% improvement, which is great, but they can't cure this because it's metastatic. That means it got there through my blood, got there through my lymph, it's in my bones and it's living in my liver. It may go to my lungs, it may go up to my brain and there's nothing that they can do about that except try and hold it back. So primary cancer is often curable, um, meaning that a large number of people with primary cancer will never get metastatic cancer, no matter which kind. And um, unfortunately with metastatic cancer, it's more challenging. There are some people who they can slow it all down uh, for a long period of time. That can be five years, 10 years, 15 years. And there's other people who will get things in in major organs, that it will be a shorter trip. It could be three years, it could be two years, but with liver it tends to be uh, not as not as long. Um, if it's quite extensive and they can't cut your large parts of your liver out and let it regrow, and, and mine's too extensive to do that. Only 1% of people who get metastatic breast cancer in their, throughout their liver will be in that position. And no, this is not primary liver cancer and you cannot give me a transplant because it's already through my blood and everywhere else. So it will just go and go through whatever new liver, etc. So that's not in the game. So having cleared all that, yeah, that's what it's like for me in my daily life, you know, week to week on this side of the fence. And I get one week off. Um, so I'm two weeks on, one week off with my treatment. And that will be for the rest of my life until the treatment is no longer effective and then I'm in the dying process. I'm still in the dying process, but I'm, it'll be an escalated dying process. So, yes, I still live in my bits of my old everyday world. I pet the cats. You can see the happy cat over there in the background enjoying my voice. I get up. I choose what to wear. I enjoy my clothes. Um, I dress differently for my, you know, my bald head. Um, I dress differently for the fact that I am breastless because I had a double mastectomy in 2011 and 2012 finished it off. Um, but you know, I enjoy my food. I enjoy my time with my gorgeous husband. I enjoy being in the physical world and, um, enjoying wind, enjoying leaves rustling, enjoying laying in the grass, enjoying the sound of the, the ground under my feet, enjoying the sounds of cicadas and birds, the physical world, the environmental world. I enjoy the creative world, um, my, my music projects that I'm finishing off, the animation stuff that I'm involved with at this point um, in my life. Um, I was, you know, I, I enjoy the, the art that people create. I enjoy uh, things that that people are doing in the physical world. I enjoy 
uh, seeing animals, farm animals, and staying and, you know, seeing nice architecture or staying on a farm or, you know, those kind of things, walking out in nature, visiting a garden, catching a train, um, all kinds of things, um, you know, playing in the garden, designing the garden. And um, I also enjoy meeting people, people that I know and uh, feel are, are really healthy people who have done the journey and have some and, and get it and uh, and people who perhaps haven't done the journey and are new on the journey and perhaps are really oblivious to everything about this side of the fence and I enjoy meeting them. I enjoy people who have lived, you know, an amount of time but have never known what it is to have visits over this side of the fence. They've never had anything seriously life-threatening or... Um, yeah, then that's okay. And sometimes their language will really show that they have no idea of this side of the events. Um, or they will be all clumsy, desperately trying to say they understand this side of the fence. Oh, well, my auntie's cat's brother had a tumour and, you know, whatever. And I can hear that they're trying to relate to this side of the fence. And, um, or they might say things like, you know, oh, we're all going to die, which is, very, very true and a, and a reasonable thing to say. But saying it repeatedly may mean they actually want to say other things but they don't know what to say. So it might be better to say, I don't know what to say. Or better to say, I'm trying to understand that side of the fence. And I would say, well, maybe it's not your time to understand that side of the fence. And, and I am happy with the fact that we're in different realities and that it is different languages and that I have to translate from where my life was before September into how I'm hearing it after September. It's okay. Just as I've got, got to frame where I am in a way that the people on that side of the fence can still understand. But I can understand that sometimes they don't know what to say or how to say it and, and they're afraid. And it really depends on what's my nature over here. And... Um, and my nature is that I get that. I get that we're in different cultures and it's different language. That things like, oh, doesn't time fly? It sounds really different on this side of the fence. Or, oh, well, we could all get hit by a bus. Uh, sounds really different on this side of the fence because I'm currently being hit by that bus. Um, uh, it could be, um, you know, uh, well, you know, I, I could have things going on and I could be this and I could be that. Well, you could, but it's not in your test results, it's not in your scans and you're not going off to treatment every week where it's completely in your face and you know that you have less than a year, most likely, to be in this physical world. So you're not actually in that space. Um, so it's okay to tell me that once, but don't tell me that repeatedly because you're not physically... In this space and if you do tell it repeatedly I'll, I'll just say what's going on with you what's going on in your feelings what's going on in your mind right now are there different ways that you would want to express this then then take some time and find those different ways um, because I'm happy to hear you just like I would be very happy if you're you're open and okay about hearing me too from where I am you might feel I only know how to talk to you in this 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 side of the fence and that's okay because I will try and talk your language I, I've come from you know there I have experience with being there I'll try and talk your language but sometimes I just need you to hear me talking in mine and um, and that's okay too so um, this different side of the fence thing we're still able to talk to each other so what was my life like before September well, in 2011, when I had my primary cancer, I, um, I knew that there was a reasonable chance that as an immune deficient person, I wouldn't be in the 70% that got to stay on this side of the fence, that I would probably have a chance from a big, big cancer family and the fact I had immune deficiency issues, that I was going to end up sooner or later on this side of the fence. And I was really lucky because I made it almost five years before I got on this side of the fence so that was really lucky but I was always pretty close to this fence you know since 2011 
Losing my respiratory drive in 2012 meant any time that I fell asleep without my machine, be it a passenger in a car or fall asleep on a sofa or laying in the sun and falling asleep, could mean life and death. So that put me really close to this fence since 2012. And I knew since uh, about 17 years old that I had immune deficiencies. And I knew it much more clearly when I was 40 and it was all really spelled out to me. So that was 13 years ago. So sometimes I would have a bug that would last for three months. I couldn't fight it. And it was around 2010. I had one for seven months. And then I got put on daily antibiotics to stop me ever getting that back because it was going to kill me if I ever got it back. And it almost killed me then. So that put me really close to the fence. So I had a lot of experience of being on this side of the fence but really close to this one. I um, I didn't have a terminal illness but I had life-threatening uh, conditions and then I also discovered in 2012 I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos types 3 and 4. Type 3 likely won't kill you but type 4 had um, currently a 90% death rate before the age of 40 from ruptured organs and um, uh, blood vessel rupture, artery, arterial ruptures. And I have a cousin who had uterine rupture and another one had spleen rupture and one had brain aneurysms or burst and a great-grandmother who died from uterine rupture. And those uh, were all people who, who had those ruptures before the age of 40. So I do have, you know, blood vessels burst and, and really raging big bruising and stuff like that that comes with that condition but I haven't had an organ um, a, a rupture yet and I may never but I when you understand you have this genetic disorder and that it is um, a seriously life-threatening genetic disorder that can cause spontaneous bowel rupture and brain aneurysms and other arterial ruptures or um, you know organ ruptures uh, you you realize wow I'm really close to the feds it's theoretical hasn't happened yet but you know and um, so there were a number of reasons why, certainly from my 40s, I knew that I was pretty close to this fence. And then from 2011, I knew I was really close to this fence and that I could find myself over that other side of the fence and on that bus driven by the Reaper sooner or later. So with ruptures, with a list and loss, uh, that could be a real fast trip and the Reapers picked you up. And if they can't fix all the bleeding and put you back together, you're gone. You the bus left. That's and I lived with that in my face and I'm I'm okay about that. Um with the the breathing thing, I I took it very seriously, but it wasn't until I fell asleep uh once without the mask for a couple of minutes, uh, a couple of years ago. And my heart went into atrial fibrillation and it was only vibrating and it was about to stop from lack of oxygen. And um, I woke up because of the strange feeling, that the vibration that was going on. And I told the doctor and he said, basically, my heart was about to stop and then my brain would be starved of oxygen and then I would be brain dead. So realizing that I very clearly could, could die in my sleep at any time and I'd now physically experienced being very close to doing that then I I knew that very quickly I could be over that fence and whipped up by the reaper and disappear I had I got my metastatic cancer just in my bones I'd be on this side of the fence for maybe three years maybe five years maybe 10 maybe 15 and I have three tumors in my spine um, it, they originally found one and they recently found there was three but those are not my threat my threat is the liver that it's extensively through the liver and that that one, when it's when it's in that kind of state, it's, it's around a year before the reaper comes back around the block. <laughs> so, um, you know, just another metaphor and picks me up and I have disappeared from this side of the fence and the world, the physical world will lose me. But of course I live on in the emotional and mental spiritual worlds of other people, their journey and the way that I've impacted that. You know, and the cats and the garden and especially... You know, my husband, my closest friends. So I know I live on, but I also may end up on that bus pretty quick, but not immediately. And so there are other people in this side of the fence and they have had some health anxiety and they get nervous. They find something, oh, it's a cancer, and they fear 
they're going to end up on this side of the fence and that fear makes them feel that they're really they're close to this but there's there's fears and there's realities so something like primary best breast cancer uh it's it's a real reality it's not just a fear uh, but you're still not on this side of the fence you're still here uh ehlers danlos syndrome type 4 it's um <coughs> it's a real reality uh when it's a, a, a clear diagnosis but you're not on this side of the fence yet um primary immune deficiencies that cause bugs that can uh, last for three to seven months oh you're really close to the fence but you're not here yet but health anxiety although you feel like you're really close to the fence the fact is you may be here you may be way over here it might just be a freckle <laughs> it might just be um, completely non-cancerous little uh, sun damage and they'll just you know spray that and it's gone and you will never have a serious life-threatening skin cancer it may um, be uh, something like melanoma which is really scary but if they get it early you might be about here on the fence they might get it a little later and you might be about here if you're really unlucky and it's spread everywhere and you have to go in the chemo queue you're like right here and they might get to it too late and it's already spread everywhere and then you're over here but health anxiety about a dark spot you think it might be melanoma you might feel like you're here your fear might make you feel like you're here but you're probably actually around here and there are people who have all kinds of uh, you know things like Crohn's or um, you know and they feel pain all the time or uh, they can have a lot of um, bowel issues or digestion issues or headaches all the time and they that these these create anxiety and discomfort and make them stare this side of the fence it's in their face but they they may have been told that their condition is not actually life-threatening and so they may still have a lot of fear of being on this side of the fence but they've been told that they're around here yeah and that this condition is never going to throw them over the other side of the fence it might be that they say oh this this condition in time might give you a higher risk of developing something that might put you over the fence might until it's until it's diagnosed and shows on a scan or shows in your blood tests um, done by uh, the people who are specialists in what your fear is um, then it's actually hasn't put you here at the fence you're in no danger of falling over that fence in any immediate way um, you know it might you might live on with your conditions like most old people accumulating your bad knees and your little little bits of TIAs that you need your aspirin for or your IBS or your you know whatever it is that is in your face and and giving you health anxiety it can if some people that will be managed until they're 90 you know or 80 or 70 or whatever and it's certainly not in the immediate situation where you can get thrown over that fence at any time but equally you know I respect what health anxiety is like and I have as a cancer patient I've had plenty of times like I had sudden double vision I woke up and it had and it never went away I have prism glasses that allow me to not see double that meant that the doctors who deal with that side of the fence stuck me straight in a machine and the MRI to see if I had brain tumors now that will make you feel anxiety um, and it's really in your face but it I didn't have brain tumors on that one yeah, I, all I had was double vision it's not good probably got it because of the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and which affects connective tissue and muscles including eye muscles but it wasn't a ruptured organ and it's just a pain in the bum um, I suddenly had foot drop and again does she have a brain tumor sticker in the MRI machine you know CT scan this whatever whatever and, um, and they found no there's nothing immediately threatening that's going to put her on this side of the fence so for some reason there's something going on a brain fart that's affecting her foot and it probably was coming from the cancer in the bar in the spine but not in the brain and at that time it was so small they wouldn't have they couldn't see anything so you know it actually probably was something that was coming up here and risking putting me over here in the bone department but they certainly didn't find all my liver mets you know 
when my liver metastases or the tumors in my liver were found, the doctor saw me and said, oh, don't worry, it's just gastritis. This was the GP. Um, and of course, it really did look just like gastritis, um, except it kept progressing. And um, so he said, no, no, I know it looks it looks kind of here, but actually it's really common and, you know, it'll come and go and, and you're really kind of over here. So two weeks later when it didn't go, he thought, well, it's gallbladder. You've got a problem with your gallbladder and we need to get you a scan and find gallstones and, you know, he said, so don't worry, it looks like you're here, but, you know, you're actually over here, it'll be cool. And I said, can we do a blood test? And so we did the blood test and he called me immediately when the results came in a week later and said, you have to come in immediately. And when we came in, we were sent off for immediate scans and um, all the tumours were visible and the diagnosis was, you know, ex extensive secondary breast cancer, um, metastases throughout the liver and they found one in the spine at that point. So at that point, I went from being told I was over here to you are not just here, you've fallen over the fence. Yeah. So um, I was in chemo. I saw the oncologist the next day. I was in chemo by the two days later. And um, I will be in that for the rest of my life or until it stops working, which will be next year. Um, so people who, there are people who, haven't got health anxiety and haven't had little niggles that have scared them like that. But I can understand the little niggles and um, I've had enough of that stuff to, to empathize with and understand. And some people are more anxious and more fixated and fearing death than others. And some people have some stuff that, you know, potentially could really throw them over the fence. And some people just worry, what if, what if, what if, what if, woulda, coulda, woulda, coulda. Um, uh, and then there's other people who are just wanting to find things relatable. They want to show that they care, but they think that the way to show it is by saying that they that they have had similar or been around similar. And sometimes by having a relative who, who's gone through that or a best friend or someone really close who's gone through that, not your brother's sister's auntie's dog, uh, it's, it's too far removed, <laughs> Um but I understand the desire to be relatable. and uh, But if it's someone really immediate and they go through that and they went over the other side of the fence and they ended up on that bus or maybe they ended up thinking they were on that side of the fence and really lucky that that time they weren't or, um, uh, you know, they had a primary cancer but they didn't end up on this side of the fence, it wasn't terminal and they, they bounced back and now they're kind of over here. Well, that I'm really grateful, you know, grateful that they got that chance. That's really cool. I got that chance too. And hopefully they never end up, you know, thrown over the fence in the future. And most of them won't, so it's cool. Um, but if you go through that with somebody, it's as if you had a close-up view, a really empathizing view of what that is. And sometimes if they did find themselves on this side of the fence, it's and maybe they were there for five years, 10 years, 15 years, you have a really good understanding by proxy of what it's like for someone on that side of the fence. Maybe they ended up on that bus for a whole range of reasons. It might have been a car accident, might have been a sudden heart attack, um, and they might have been on a quick bus or a slow bus, or they might have come over here and they had a whole bunch of operations and they came out of a terminal state and now they're, they're back here. And maybe over time they kind of they're cruising around here, um, but if someone suddenly went fast on the bus, there's a lot of grief. There's a lot of loss, and there's a an understanding of of what death is. But this this side of the fence is like the kind of the waiting room. But hopefully you spend your life not waiting. Hopefully you spend your life living and enjoying. And part of that is keeping a dialogue with the with those two sides of the fence and enjoying the lives of the people who are completely oblivious to that fence, that other side of the fence at all. And they think it's all one thing and they never had to confront it because we package up all our dying people and we package up the deaf people and we hide it all, especially from children. We hide it from, and, some, and, and sometimes we train people to just put their head in the sand. It's not your drama. You're busy living. You know, and that's cool too. That is really cool. That is exactly what 
um, all, all of us perhaps you know should be doing before we ever get to this point where we live with that other side of the fence in our face or find ourselves on that side of the fence and I still love to meet those people and hang with those people and hear those people and enjoy their obliviousness I don't need them to really get it unless they are um, button up against this fence and saying and doing things that are really draining me or making me feel that I've got to behave as if I'm on this side of the fence when I'm not or they're not hearing my language they're not hearing where I'm at in my last year of my life and I I, I want them to, to if they love me they really they want to know where am I at um, and it's not all misery and horror and pain and whatever there'll be some of that you know down the track but it's not like that even in the chemo suite, if you went there, it's friendly, it's buzzy, it's full of Christmas decorations at the moment. Um, I'm handling chemo really well. Um, I'm I'm really lucky on that. Um, yeah, for me, I have a an everyday life, but I I do I am very happy for people to hear my reality if they want to, uh, but not to keep forcing me to behave as though as though I'm still living on this side. I lost my permanent residency. Um, I lost my temporary residency. I'm a tourist. And a tourist is someone who knows they've got to go back, they've got to go soon. They know they're not able to stay. And one day I will be transitioned onto that bus. It might be, you know, cancer's got me on the bus and I say, hey, you know, I'm taking my breathing machine off. Let's make this a quick trip. It might be that, uh, you know, cancer's in my face on this side of the fence and I just go, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it myself. I'm driving the bus myself. See you later. You know, I'm going to take my mask off. I'm not waiting for the, the, the cancer reaper to come back and pick me up. I'm out of here. And that's, that's, that's okay too. But it's absolutely okay for all those people who just live in their daggy little lives, you know, lives with head in the sand, lives that are exuberant, lives that are silly, lives that are on a mission, lives that are lazy, lives that are wasting time. Wasting time's a great thing to do. But, you know, being, being on a mission's a good little trip in the theme park of life too. Um, uh, being oblivious, <laughs> uh, going through the motions, um, being truly alive, fully experiencing things, you know, finding your creativity, uh, challenging the inner critic, um, uh, trying not to be so messed up so you can get kind of on, on the page and live your life you know, more cohesively, less chaotically. Whatever is your journey, I love it. You're all part of the paint box. And um, so you, you do have a place in my life. All kinds of people, strangers, strangers at train stations, strangers on a bus, you know, strangers at the bus stop, people I pass by at the supermarket, people I know, people I know well, um, people I'm yet to know. Um, you all have a place in my life because I'm, I haven't got on that bus yet. I'm still on this side of the fence. It's still connected to the physical world. It is a different culture. It is a different perspective. I am coming from a different place. And I do hear and see and feel things from that different place. In that sense, it's not the same language and it needs translations. And just the same way people will, when they really hear where I'm at over here, they will need to translate it into their world too. <laughs> and that's okay. This is a meeting of cultures. Let's meet. Um, so I hope that that's, that's been helpful. To talk about the two sides of the fence and what that means. Talk about citizenship, permanent residency, temporary residency, a tourist visa, and being exiled onto the bus, making that transition, and that it doesn't have to all be doom and gloom and tragedy and horror and scary and but it equally doesn't have to be a flippant sort of casting off of, oh we're all gonna die. You know, that that's a good thing to know that we are all gonna die. It's realistic, but there's ways so like, you know, I, I understand it because we are actually all going to die as soon as we're born. It's inevitable as organic physical beings, our, our cars, these vehicles, they're going to die. And there's a big difference between that and defending yourself against 
that side of the fence. Well, we're all going to die. So just catch yourself. Catch yourself and your feelings about death, your feelings about dying, your feelings about grief, your feelings about losing someone, your feelings about being lucky that you're on that side of the fence, your feelings about feeling awkward and ignorant and uncertain about how do you connect with and talk to someone who is, the, is cl really close to the fence, has fallen over the fence or knows that bus has got a quick trip or a slow trip or a medium trip. How do you talk to them? You know, in a society where we package them away, where we hush up, where we don't talk about it, where we say death and dying is all terrible and bad and darkness and oh, or we mystify it with ghosts and afterlife and sky fairies. You know, how do we talk about it? Well, we talk about it as on the level. We talk about it realistically. We talk about it with an open mind and an open heart. And we talk about it knowing that we have our own subjective reality and that we try and put that subjectivity sort of just on the table so we can actually be open to the translation between the two realities. And and if you're on this side of the fence, you might say, why has why it always got to be like, you know, you've always got to talk from your side. Why do we have to hear everything about how you're experiencing? Because you've got the luxury of more than a year to live, most likely. Yes, there might be a sort of like a 0 0.0005, I think a 0, 0, 0 0.05 chance of you finding yourself here and, um, you know, over the other side of the fence. If you are under 60, that's relatively what the stats are. But that's not the same as really uh, really living in those shoes. But, um, yeah, just, just be open. Just be chilled. Um, recognize your fear. Recognize your anxieties. And keep the channels open. And, yes, this the person who's on this side of the fence, they may like to be heard from their reality too. And you may need patience because they, don't, they may not have 10 or 15 or 20 years casually talk to you about this place they found themselves. They might have, you know, some people have two months, some people have six months, some will have a year, some will have three years or five years. And in my case, it's a year. Um, and and I know that you might have lots to say about your your reality and, and that's worth hearing too. But if you feel that you're not getting equal time, it's because we don't each have equal time. The person on this side of the fence might not have very much time. They might need to allocate it really carefully. They might need to make sure that when they're in this phase, they're just, they're just not committing a lot of time to, to arguments and, and, and yeah, stuff because they they might be doing chemo. They might be tired. They might be you know, going through a lot of mental and emotional stuff that has to do with the transitions on this side of the fence, transitioning from here to here, transitioning from here to understanding that that bus has gone around the block, what it means and what they want to do whilst it's travelling around the block. So if they don't feel, if you don't feel that they're giving you 100% of listening to you, it's because you've got the luxury of time. And even if you know, hey, well, we could all die tomorrow. Yeah, we could. But chances are that really the majority won't. If you're not really already very close to that fence, chances are that it's not an immediate thing of, yes, we are all going to die eventually, but you might be in the 0 0.05 kind of chance of, of getting there soon. Um, yeah. Unless maybe you're like 99 or 90. But if you're under 60, that's kind of your deal. So, um, yeah, and just look at that realistically. And that's cool. And uh, so hopefully that's explained some of the diversity. And uh, certainly I'm not going to get militant about what people should or shouldn't say. Um, yeah, there are certain things that are more helpful and less helpful. Um, but just... Mostly, share your life, but be open to the other culture that the person's found themselves in, and you'll get it. And if you don't get it, just 
don't pretend to get it. Just say, you know, I don't get it. And, and I would say, that's okay. And I might say, do you have any questions? And you might say, well, yeah, I don't know how to phrase them. And I'll say, just phrase them how they are in your world and, and I'll try and answer them. It might be that you say, no, actually, I don't want to ask any questions. I just want to, just want to enjoy some time with you. And, and that's okay too. Um, it might be because you've got a lot of regrets. Oh, I should have this, should have, would have, could have. And the person on this side of the fence might say, well, you know, my time is not, I don't have a lot of time. So I'll hang out with you because you've got a lot of woulda, shoulda, coulda. But it's, 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 you're really saying that you need to work out your, your stuff. And it might be that you want to just accumulate some really good experiences. And that's okay too. But the majority of my time will be with the people who, who, who don't need to do woulda, coulda, shoulda. Because they were already, they were already really healthy people in my world. And uh, so that's, they're the people that I'm going to spend a lot more time with um, because, you know, I'm, I'm doing my journey and I have enough time to spend helping people with their journey a bit, but mostly I'm just getting on with mine and it's okay for them to deal with theirs in their own world too. Um, and if they need help with that, there's, there's counsellors and they can go and see those counsellors and deal with their regret. And... Um, uh, which I think is a healthy thing to do. Uh, okay, that's it. Bye.